Her name was Lola. She was a showgirl with yellow feathers in her hair and a dress cut down to there. She would merangi and do the cha-cha. And while she tried to be a star, Tony always tended bar. Panic immediately gets her away from everyone now. She cannot come into contact with anyone. Isolate her. Across the crowded floor, they worked from eight till four. They were young and they had each other. Who could ask for more at the Copa Copacabana? It was the hottest spot north of Havana. At the Copa Copacabana. Music and passion were always the fashion. At the Copa, they fell in love. I'm sorry to have misplaced the trust which so many of my friends and colleagues have placed in me and my work. It was a lonely death. Is there anything sadder? His name was Rico. He wore a diamond. He was escorted to his chair. He saw Lola dancing there. And when she finished, he called her over. But Rico went a bit too far. Tony sailed across the bar. And then the punches flew. And chairs were smashed in two. There was blood and a single gunshot. But just who shot who? Method after method. One way or another. He was going to get you. We might be looking at one of the most dangerous minds we have ever seen. At the Copa, Copa Cabana. It was the year 1978 and it was crazy, baby. Welcome to Extraordinary Stories Podcast. of the founder of the People's Temple, Jim Jones. Well, Terry, I reported over His a week ago that Monday was sleep. a suspect in the Some disappearance. Some had pillows beneath their heads. Some died alone, separated by our families Is until the end. Babies were fed the lethal potion that was believed sort of each day in about five He's minutes after over following me. a mixture of cyanide. Hold a Juliet. It's not an aircraft. It's... Can you describe the... I'll plead not guilty right now. Well, Terry, I reported over a week ago that Bundy was a suspect in the disappearance of an eight-year-old The aircraft has just passed over me at least a thousand feet above. Is there any Air Force aircraft in the vicinity? No known aircraft. Is there any Air Force aircraft in the vicinity? Seems to be playing some sort of game. He's flying over me. Call the Sierra Juliet. It's not an aircraft. It's... I'll be not guilty right now. Temple, Jim Jones. His son, who were simply going right to sleep. Now. Some had pillows beneath their heads. Some died alone, separated by all families until the end. With it. Babies were fed the lethal potion with a... It's believed each lived about five minutes after swallowing a mixture of cyanide. Hey, how are you? You well? Are you good? I am. Okay, I'll start just by saying thanks again for the comments, the emails, the messages about the last few episodes. I do really appreciate them. I'll just say quickly, this episode is a little bit graphic. There's some quite graphic descriptions. So, not, I mean, not that I'm imagining that you're listening to the podcast, you know, with a five-year-old around, but you might be. Hey, 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 I'm not judging if you are, but I'm just saying this might not be the episode for a child in the room or a child in the car to be listening to. So, um, yeah, it does get a little bit graphic at points, but I weighed it up and I think it's necessary for the impact of the story. Okay, well, that's all I've got to say. Let's get to the stories, sugar lips. (laughs) Are you ready? Okay, let's go. (laughs) 
When Janet Parker's body finally gave up, gave in and let go, it was a blessing. Janet had been in the most horrendous pain for a month now. Not allowed to see anyone, not allowed to touch anyone. And her body lay on the floor of a garage. Janet was wrapped in a transparent body bag. Her body placed on a floor of sawdust and the garage smelled of disinfectant. It was 1978 and the city of Birmingham in the UK was under pressure. Real pressure. And it was all because of Janet Parker. Janet Parker worked at the anatomy department of Birmingham Medical Centre. So she mainly specialised in photography. So, August the 11th, 1978, it's just a standard day at work for Janet. You know, photograph, 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 write it up in a journal, blah, blah, blah. A normal day at work. And around about lunchtime, she begins to feel a bit unwell. And at first, she can't, she can't quite place the feeling. She just knows that she's a bit off. She's got a bit of a headache, a bit of sore muscles, feeling a little bit weak. So she thinks, I'll just power through it. It'll just, it'll probably just pass. But by the late afternoon, it hadn't just passed. She's not feeling any better. So she calls her husband, Joseph, at his work and she says, I'm not feeling too good at all. I think I'll leave early and see the doctor. So she packs up her work stuff. She tells her boss she needs to go. She needs to see the doctor and off she goes. So the doctor takes a look at the otherwise in fine, fit health Janet and runs some tests. Now the doctor sends her away with the suggestion that she rests for a few days, takes some paracetamol. She has a bit of a fever running now, so the doctor says, look, just get to bed, take some paracetamol, keep your fluid level up, you'll be fine. Now, for Janet, the thing that was the sorest is her skin. It's her skin that doesn't feel right. She can... Her skin's, like, really itchy, and she's just got these, like... Oh, yeah, her skin just does not feel right at all. And she starts to see these little marks appearing on her arms and her legs. It's just these little, like, blotches, and she doesn't know what they are. So the day after she'd seen the doctor, she gets a phone call. The doctor says, look, can you come back in? We need to take a second look here. So, we can't quite figure out from her tests what the hell's going on. So they do more tests. This time they take some skin samples from her arms. This doctor leaves to discuss it with another doctor. And they're absolutely fascinated by this. They, they come back and they say to Janet, we've worked out what it is. It's chicken pox. Adult chicken pox. Now, Janet is a bit surprised by this. Because, well, maybe you're thinking this. I mean, I know I certainly was thinking this when I was looking at this story. I thought adults didn't get chicken pox. I thought it was shingles. Well, actually, I didn't know that, right? I only recently learned that adults... <laughs> Adult chicken pox is called shingles. I thought shingles were something you found on a beach. I genuinely thought they were from the sea. Anyway, that's what she's told it is. So they, they run a few more tests, but they're pretty sure that's what it is. So she goes home. She calls her mother, Hilda. And she says to her mum, Hilda, yeah, they're saying it's chicken pox. And immediately her mum is confused. You see... Hilda can remember nursing Janet when she was six years old through chickenpox. So this doesn't seem right to her. Hilda's like, listen, Janet, when you were a wee lassie, you had chickenpox. Well, she wouldn't say lassie, of course, because she's not Scottish. She's from Birmingham. What would she say? When you were a wee girl? Is that how they talk from Birmingham? I don't know, something like that. <laughs> anyway, when you were young, you had it. So this doesn't make any sense. However, Janet's condition worsens over the next two days. 
by now she can't get out of bed. She can't stand up without someone holding her. Her parents and her husband have to be by her bedside at all times to lift water to her mouth and to feed her because she's so weak. Now they're all thinking this cannot just be chicken pox. And then they get a call from the doctor's office. The second set of tests have come back. Janet is to be rushed immediately from her home to a hospital. No explanation given, no hanging about, it has to happen now. So an ambulance arrives and it takes Janet, but not to the hospital that she thought she would be in or that her husband or her parents thought. It wasn't the busy city centre Birmingham hospital. It was a facility out of town, an isolated hospital on the edge of the city. It's tucked away from view. It's called the Catherine de Barnes Isolation Hospital. And it only gets used in the most extreme of cases. This is not a hospital full of people. Right now, this hospital is for one person only, Janet Parker. This hospital, it still gets used and it is so creepy looking. Oh, it's horrible, it's small, it's grey, it looks like a prison. Horrible. Now this is where Janet has to be because the tests when they came back from the doctors said no, this wasn't chicken pox. It was way more serious. Janet Parker had smallpox. Her skin had broken out into huge sores. She's dying. What Janet and her family are not to know is that doctors are so alarmed by her condition that they've called the World Health Organization and alerted them to a case of smallpox, which it was believed had been completely eradicated. It was believed that smallpox, which had killed nearly 300 million people, was gone. And yet, here was a woman in the UK dying from it. Now immediately her family, they're told they must isolate. Anyone who's come into contact with Janet must isolate. And this is where a panic begins. Doctors from all over the world are flying into Birmingham attempting to stop this spread. A disease this serious has to be stopped or the world faces a race against millions of deaths. So an investigation into how Janet had contracted it begins and it doesn't take long to trace it back to her workplace. Now you remember that I told you Janet worked in a medical centre as a photographer in the anatomy department. Well, we need to talk about her colleague, Professor Bedson. So Professor Bedson is in charge of the dangerous viruses unit at Janet's place of work. And on the day that she began to feel unwell, Janet had been using a microscope, which days before had been looking at smallpox. Imagine, if you will, do you know, like in a laboratory, they got those little like microscopes. You look through it and you see the like the little shapes, the cells that are like little bricks. Well, Janet had been examining just to take more photographs and just to journal things. She'd been examining smallpox under controlled conditions, of course, but had somehow contracted it. Professor Bedson realising it had come from his laboratory had to really own up quickly and, and say that this is where it's come from. So the goings on of Janet being taken to an isolation hospital, it hadn't gone unnoticed by her neighbours. And by this time, Janet's mum had confided in a few friends that Janet was ill, her health was rapidly declining. And before long, doctor's surgeries in Birmingham were being 
inundated with people calling to say they had been in contact with Janet, their family were falling ill, they were terrified that smallpox had reached their household. And very quickly, press began gathering outside of Birmingham's major hospitals, not the hospital that Janet's in, but gathering outside of all the major hospitals, seeing the World Health Organization, doctors from everywhere around the world, and a real panic breaks out. Smallpox had broken out in Birmingham, and it was a race against time. So with the only known vaccination that they had, doctors quickly vaccinated nearly 600 people in Birmingham as Janet lay dying in the isolation hospital. Two specialist nurses were sent to work with Janet, both dressed in quarantine suits. You know the ones, I mean, the the ones that, that look like a beekeeping outfit. You know, with the sort of full, full suits with the headgear and the... Yeah, the whole thing. Honestly, do you know what? I've got days, right? Days where when I just can't find the right thing to wear or I'm having a bad hair day, I think to myself, do you know what? One of those bloody beekeeping outfits. That'd be great right about now. <laughs> Janet's husband and her parents are only allowed to visit her once they've been vaccinated and they're wearing full protective clothing. But by now, Janet's heart is failing. She's gone blind in both eyes and she can no longer communicate verbally. Her family are told they're no longer allowed to visit. Professor Bedson, whose lab this had come from, he tries to speak to the press and apologise, but he's under a lot of fire here. This happened in his lab, and under that pressure, he takes his own life. In his garden shed, he slits his own throat open with a knife and bleeds to death, leaving a suicide note apologising for Janet's condition. He says, I am so sorry to have misplaced the trust which so many of my friends and colleagues have placed in me and my work. The World Health Organisation are trying to tell everyone that they have it under control. Janet Parker will be the only case of this. With isolation and with vaccinations rolling out, there are no more reported cases in Birmingham. But what of Janet? Well, on September 11th, 1978, a month after the day that she started to feel unwell, two nurses wrap her dead body in a transparent body bag They lay her down on a floor of sawdust which is covered in disinfectant and they leave Janet there. Janet Parker died without her husband or her parents being able to see her one last time. It was just too dangerous to expose them even though they'd been vaccinated. And with her death it was declared that smallpox was beaten. Her funeral was three weeks later and was only attended by her husband and her parents. The absolutely tragic tale of Janet Parker isn't often told and was not talked about much at the time for the fear that it might cause a panic in the general public. And so ends story one. Okay, 1978, wasn't it great? Barry Manilow had uh, a number one around the world with his biggest ever hit, Copacabana. In Canada, a woman escaped from a psychiatric facility and was only apprehended when she threw a human head at police. Where she got the human head from, no one knows. And... Cinnamon Life, the breakfast cereal, was launched, which we now know as Cinnamon Grahams. <laughs> Tell me this, in what other in what other podcast would you get a fact about Barry Manilow, someone throwing a human skull, and breakfast cereal? You just, you know, you just wouldn't get that anywhere else. 
<laughs> and probably for good reason. Okay, story two. In 1992, not long before his execution, John Wayne Gacy starts to try and twist the story, to rewrite it and present it differently. In an interview from prison, he says, When they try to paint me as a monster, it's just ludicrous. Is it? I mean, is it though? Have a word for yourself, man. He says, don't put me in the same boat as Charles Manson, Ted Bundy. These men were killers and monsters. I am not one of them. Okay, we'll see. Now, although he'd begun his monstrous ways in 1972, it wasn't until 78 that Gacy would take his last victim and the one which would allow the last six years to catch up with him. Robert Peast was 15 years old, and his body would be found in the De Plains River in Illinois, a popular place for Gacy to dump his victims. So, the question is, how did we get from just one more teenage boy vanishing to the uncovering of Gacy's crimes. Well, Robert Peast worked part-time in a pharmacist's and in December 1978, he finished a shift and it had ended about 11 o'clock in the evening. Now, he called his mum to say that he wouldn't be home immediately. He was going to meet a man who had offered him some extra part-time work on a construction site and he would be home after he met this man. Robert Peast would never make it home. Now his parents were concerned, so they contacted police. I know I tell a lot of stories where police will go, oh, it's runaways, and turn a blind eye to it, and I get frustrated by that sometimes, but this story's kind of the opposite. Because Robert Peast is considered a good kid, Police are immediately suspicious. They think, mm, something's not right here. And within 24 hours, there is a huge search party out in the snow looking for robber. So now, of course, the most obvious place to go is to the man who was going to offer him work on the construction site. They track down this man and they bring him to the police station. A Mr John Wayne Gacy. Gacy pleads complete ignorance. Nope, never heard of the boy, don't know anything about it. So police let him go. But it's not over for police with Gacy. They decide they're going to track him closely for the next four days. And without any idea that he's being watched 24 hours a day, he carries on his life. Now, why so closely? Why set up 24 hours a day surveillance on a man that they don't really have anything on at this moment in time? Well, it's because 10 years previous to this, John Wayne Gacy had been convicted and sent to prison for a short time for raping a teenage boy. And he'd spent 18 months in prison for this crime. So that's why he's being watched. Now, you wouldn't know this from the way that he talks in his interviews, but John Wayne Gacy is smart. It doesn't take him long to work out that he's being followed by police. And this is where, it's so weird, this is where he really shows or starts to show his true colours as one of the most bizarre. And, you know, I hate to use the word interesting because it, it gives him more power than he deserves. Maybe I'll not use the word interesting. Intriguing? Well, I still think that gives him way too much power. Anyway, this is where he starts to really show himself as just... Yeah, someone so kind of fascinating. Aware that he's being followed. He knows this is happening. He's going on his little night drives. He's speeding around the streets. He starts just talking to the police that are following him. 
if they pull him over for speeding, he's like, look guys, I know you're following me. Let's be friends. This doesn't need to be a game of cat and mouse. I'm aware of what's happening. You're aware of what's happening. He does really weird things. Like, he goes to a late night petrol station. And he's in, so he's inside the petrol station. He's paying for something. And one of the police officers has followed him in to the petrol station just in case he tries to flee or make an attempt to get away. And he introduces the police officer to the cashier of the petrol station as his friend. <laughs> okay, weird. I mean, he's like, hey, random cashier in the late night garage. Here's my friend, the police. Then he flips from this to making calls to the FBI to tell them he's being harassed. Then it's back to trying to be friends with the cops. He actually does so much talking to the police that he's then able to start sending them on wild goose chases. He tells them about this piece of land that he owns miles away. And of course at the mention of a piece of land miles away, police jump into action. Has this maybe got anything to do with the missing 15 year old Robert Paste? Police go search the area. Turns out Casey doesn't own this piece of land. He's just made it up. So he's just playing with police at this point. He's just, it's a game to him. Now he might be thinking he's a right smarty pants, but while he's out driving about up to all this business with police, there is a search warrant issued for his house. So here's what police are hoping they're going to find in John Wayne Gacy's house. They want to find Robert Peast alive. If not that, they want to find a clue that Gacy has been somehow involved in his disappearance. If not that, they just want to find the smallest of clues, anything that they can get this man back to talk to them. There's got to be something interesting. So they look around his house and they stumble upon a piece of jewellery, a ring. If you like to then you should have put a ring on it. A ring. A ring that belongs to a teenage boy who had gone missing months before. So police are like, okay, we we're looking for one boy and now we've got a clue linking to a second. Hmm. So police are standing in Gacy's kitchen, which is meticulously clean, discussing this ring and could it be a link to these missing boys? They have no idea that they're standing on top of 29 dead bodies buried under Gacy's house. Police in their investigation with not a great deal to go on. Yeah, they've got the ring, they've got their suspicions. They decide they're just going to start asking some questions. So they go to... John Wayne Gacy's construction company that he owns and they ask his employees about their boss. What can they tell him? Now one thing that comes out in the conversation is they mention that he wanted a space to be dug in his basement. And they think, okay, what's that then? And they explain, well, he wanted this sort of crawl space built beneath the floor of his house. And when they're talking about this, it sparks a memory for one of the police officers who'd been a part of the John Wayne Gacy surveillance. This police officer remembers that a few days before, <laughs> when he'd been surveying John Wayne Gacy, he'd gone into his house for a drink. <laughs> I'm telling you, how, how, what is going on here? What? <laughs> 1978, what are you doing? Police literally, this is what I'm saying, but th this weirdness, John Wayne Gacy was literally inviting these police officers into his house for a cocktail. I mean, it's just nuts. And the fact that those police were like, yeah, okay, fine, <laughs> going in. What you say? Sex on the beach? Sure, it sounds great. I mean, it's just, it's weird. Anyway, this police officer, he's remembered that he's gone into John Wayne Gacy's house to have a cocktail 
and at one point he's nipped to the bathroom. Now, the thing that he remembers is the bathroom's cold, but it's also got this weird smell. Now, at the time, he thinks it's damp. He thinks, it, the police officer thinks, oh, that was a damp smell. And it's only now, when the construction workers are saying, well, he wanted this crawl space built, that that officer is thinking, that might not have been damp. That might have been the smell of bodies. Now, this is nine days into him being followed 24 hours a day. Police don't really know what's going on here. But the closer they look at Gacy's behaviour, they start to worry that he's going to commit suicide. They start following him as he goes from late night garage to late night garage and they're looking at what he's buying and it's painkillers. And they think he's planning an overdose. So seeing the amount of drugs that he's buying, thinking, shit, he's gonna kill himself, they arrest him. Now they just arrest him on like a rubbish charge. It's like, I don't know, going through a red light or, not that that's a rubbish charge, but you know what I mean, it's not, they're not arresting him with anything serious here, they're just arresting him so that they can get him into the police station. Because they know he's part of the Robert Peace thing and they know they've got this ring now but while all of this is happening, it's the search of his basement that's beginning. And this is really going to be the start of when the horror of what John Wayne Gacy has done is going to come to light. Two officers go down to the basement. Now what I'm talking about here gets referred to as the crawl space, I've already said that. And it's a space between the ground and the floor of the house, which is just basically like this sort of rotten, damp place. Designed basically to stop the damp from the ground seeping up into the floors of your house. It's just a gap under your house. Two officers start digging around and it's not long before they reach down, they feel something, it's hard, they pull it up and it's a bone, and it looks like it's part of an arm. So right now they know there is a body in the crawl space. So they get ready to retrieve the rest of it. Back at the police station, the detectives who got Gacy say to him, we think there's a body in your crawl space. And John Wayne Gacy says, Okay, it's time to clear the air. I'll talk. He looks at the officers and he says, You're not going to find just one body in the crawl space. There's 29 down there. At this point, Gacy asks for a piece of paper and a pen. He draws an aerial view of the crawl space and he draws the location of each and every body that's buried down there from memory. He can tell detectives exactly where each body is. Now that he's done this, he becomes like a Oh, I don't know, like a, a it's like, like a cut on your hand that won't stop bleeding. Now that he's opened up, there's no shutting him up. He freely tells detectives that this began years ago. And it started when he took his first victim and he stabbed him to death after raping him. But that was just too messy. That's when he'd come up with another way to kill the boys. The boys? Detectives ask. Yes, Gacy tells them. It's all teenage boys. I'd have sex with them, then kill them. So what was this new way of killing if stabbing was too messy? Oh, good old-fashioned strangling, Gacy tells them, casually. Honestly, this guy... I mean, he's not boasting and he's not bragging. He's, he's just telling officers, like, 
he's describing his trip to the supermarket, like so functional. Back at his house, police bring in a team of builders to rip up the floor and get access. And by now there's crowds gathering outside of Gacy's house, which is in like quite a nice little suburban quiet street. So now you've got news reporters there, you've got people gathering in the street, and there's so much interest in this, and rumour has spread that bodies are being brought up from the basement of John Wayne Gacy's house. And the main detective, I mean, what a horrendous job for this man. The main detective has to come out every day at six o'clock, appear live on the news to give the body count. So he'll come out one day and he'll say, today we brought two bodies from the crawl space. So he'll come out and he'll say, today we brought two bodies from the crawl space. The next day, he comes and he says, the body count is six today. Then the next day, we found a skull in the garage. Now the families of missing teenage boys are beginning to appear outside of Gacy's house in the hope that they might finally get some answers to where their missing son or grandson or brother or cousin might be. What a grim thought. How horrendous. I mean, if you stop to process that, it is just fucking awful. Those poor family members come to that house of horror every day to stand for hours in the cold, hoping, just hoping, they might get a little piece of evidence or something just to let them know that their loved one is linked to Gacy's house. And the number just keeps going up daily. Eight bodies, eleven bodies, then we're up at seventeen, twenty-four, and eventually twenty-nine bodies. So where did this all begin? Well, in 1942, John Wayne Gacy was born into a family with an abusive father, but a very loving mother. He grew up really close to his sister, who was quite similar in age to him. I don't think there was a big age difference between them. His poor sister, she would be interviewed and examined by journalists forever when all this happened. Anyway, grown up, Gacy, he wasn't strong. He was born with a, a heart condition, meaning that he couldn't do a lot of sports and his father had always called him a sissy. He was a sensitive boy and his father and... Other boys at school would use the word sissy. Not a great word. I don't like it. Well, I, t I tell you, John Wayne Gacy maybe needed this, although this didn't exist at the time, so he wouldn't have had it. There is a song by RuPaul <laughs> called Sissy That Walk, and it's 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 about reclaiming the word sissy. It's very camp. It's very over the top. It's a sort of big, sort of anthemic kind of reclaiming of the word sissy. Um which is really a horrendous word um, to call someone who's gay. Anyway, when John Wayne Gacy worked out as a teenager that he was gay, it was the mid to late 50s and he just, he felt trapped. He couldn't speak to anyone about it, he didn't know how to deal with those feelings. So when he got a little bit older into his late teenage years, he did sort of various different bits and pieces of jobs. He, he thought about going into politics at one point. He worked in KFC. So if you were, you know, around the Chicago area um, when he was a teenager, chances are you might have had yourself a Zinger Tower burger <laughs> prepared by John Wayne Gacy's hands. He took a job at the local funeral home. That was his part-time job. But after a year, he was let go from the funeral home. Why? Well, it turns out he'd been interfering with the dead bodies of teenage boys. When I say interfering, I mean he was having sex. When his boss figured this out, he was fired. The kind of extra blow for John Wayne Gacy at this point was that he'd been kicked out of his house by his father. They just weren't getting along at all. And the funeral home 
was where he slept. So essentially he was fired and homeless in the same day. I mean, did nobody think, did nobody think it was odd that a teenager lived and worked in a funeral home? I don't know. I just think that's odd. Okay, from here, he would meet a woman, he would get married, and he would have two kids. And from here, he sort of took on the role of community man, father. Everyone loved John Wayne Gacy. I mean, the amount of documentaries out there about him, you hear the same thing over and over to the point it gets boring, but it is, I suppose, important to know everyone loved John Wayne Gacy. The Chicago communities that he lived in, he was just like this godlike character. He was invited to every party. He was always popular. He did actually do quite a bit in politics for a while, and he met some like quite high up people within politics and they all had good things to say about him but that love in a few of those communities was about to change because he kidnaps and rapes a 15 year old boy called Donald Vorhes and for this he's arrested charged and he goes to prison his wife leaves him takes the kids and in his lifetime, John Wayne Gacy would never see his children again. But he gets out of prison after a short time. He moves to another part of Chicago, another community, and he gets married for a second time. He starts fresh. The marriage, the second marriage, it doesn't last very long. His wife leaves, she's not happy. But that community love is still there. And this is where the clown business begins. He would dress up as a clown for the local kids' parties, the various neighbourhood events. Pogo the clown. Pogo as in, you know, the stick. That was his name. What an awful name for a clown. Why the fuck would you pick that? That's terrible. Anyway, Pogo the clown is a family favourite. Because he's no ordinary clown, you see. He can do tricks. He does magic with rope and handcuffs. And of course, that's all very innocent at kids' parties. Oh, look at the fun things the clown can do. But what nobody knew is that these handcuff tricks and these rope tricks, these were the same tools that John Wayne Gacy was using on young men from all over Chicago. He used a variety of methods to get boys back to his home. Method one, go for the runaways. He would see the runaways, he would spot the vulnerable and he would say, do you want a lift somewhere? I can, I can give you a lift. They would get in the car and he would chloroform them. Method two, gunpoint. Just straight up, gun in their face, get in the car. Method three, he would go for the homeless and he would offer them work. He would say, do you want a job? If so, come, come back to my house, we'll sort out the details and I'll get you working and earning money. And method four, he would go for male teenage sex workers. He would say, if you come back to my house, I'll pay you for sex. So when he had the willing victims back at his house, by that I mean the ones who thought they were there for paid sex or thought it was a job offer, he'd say, can I show you a magic trick? They'd say, yeah, okay. He'd pull out the rope, he'd wrap it around the wrists and he'd say, now I just need to put this little bit round your neck for the trick to work. And with their hands tied and the rope round their neck, he'd slowly choke them to death. And if they weren't dying fast enough, he'd use chloroform to knock them out and strangle them. He would move the boys around the house, from the bathroom, to the bedroom, to the living room. He would do things like drip candle wax all over them. He would beat them in one room, set their face on fire in another room. 
What he liked to do was get them into his house, chain them up to something with the handcuffs, and then he would go upstairs and get into his clown costume. Gacy would have sex with these bodies in various states of unconsciousness and sometimes when they were dead. Sometimes the bodies would lie around his house for days and he'd have sex with them before they went to the basement. Over time he mixed up his methods of torture. Method one, drowning victims in the bathtub. Method two, beating them to death with a fire poker. Method three, attaching their bodies to a homemade rack and strangling them. Method four, if the struggle was just too much, a gunshot. He played with his victims. And I think this is where I find, I find John Wayne Gacy one of the hardest stories, one of the hardest cases now of course right you cannot compare serial killers you just can't it, it's try it's like trying to compare apples with cherries it just you, it, there's no comparison i think this is maybe in my mind i think maybe i'm saying this because i've just watched the night stalker documentary on netflix and i've recently done the bundy story B- but if if you look at their crimes Yes, they were serial killers, but they were haphazard. I mean, Richard... I've forgotten his name already. I just finished watching. What's his name? Richard Ramirez. I was going to call him Richard Miranda's. Richard Ramirez was like, one day it's going to be a 20-year-old woman. The next day it's going to be an 80-year-old man. The method kept changing. And I know that was his kind of thing. I know that that's explained in the documentary that actually not having a method was kind of how they managed to figure out what was going on and you know Bundy yeah there was a type but also the murders were quite random in terms of how each person died I think what I'm saying is the difference with Gacy is he's so methodical there is a system a real system and it's terrifying to just think about how methodical he was he's like a lion hunting these gorgeous zebras and there is nothing the zebra can do that's going to stop it because he has a method if he can't get you into his car through persuasion he's got three other ways he's going to do it and if you won't die from strangulation he's going to find another way to kill you there's a really horrendous story that comes out in his trial And it's told by John Wayne Gacy himself. He talks about one of the victims he had handcuffed to his coffee table. And the victim wakes up from being chloroformed to find John Wayne Gacy pissing all over him. And immediately the victim tries to move, he tries to run, and he ends up dragging the coffee table with him. It turns into this horrific fight, this battle. It gets really ugly. The coffee table's moving across the room because the boy is handcuffed to it. John Wayne Gacy is fighting with him. And in the end, Gacy tells the court calmly, I had to smash his head through the glass of the table just to shut him up. And then what next, asks the court. I continue to have sex with them, Casey says. He would photograph the boys when they were dying and when they were dead before they went to the basement. He would take their belongings from them and keep them. Once the mess was tidied up, once the house was spotless, the urge would be over for a while for Casey and then it would come over him again. So, from the police side of things, by the 27th of December 1978, they've recovered all that they can from Gacy's house, 29 bodies. The house is demolished once the every piece of evidence is out. Now, why so fast? Well, basically because it had become a tourist attraction. 
hundreds of daily visitors and residents of the town. They wanted their life back. They were like sick of this. John Wayne Gacy's house had become, you know, a, a, a circus event. And they were like, we don't want this anymore. It needs to go. By the start of 1979, Gacy had told police where the other victims were, buried in nearby parks. And there were four other victims, bringing the total number to 33. The last body to be found was that of 15-year-old Robert Peast, the boy with who this all started. So the trial begins and lasts for six weeks. All the grisly details of how he killed comes out in the trial and gets reported on a daily basis. This is really the first time that people have heard his actual descriptions of what he did. It won't be, like I said earlier, it won't be until 1992 when he goes on camera that he actually is publicly accessible. I don't know if you've ever watched those interviews, they're on YouTube, you'll find them really easily if you haven't. I mean, they're weird, they're unsettling, he talks a load of pish, he talks a load of nonsense. At one point he tries to say the smell that was coming up into his kitchen wasn't from the bodies, it was actually his dog. He tries to explain that he had a little dog and that when he would go to work he had to close the dog in the kitchen and the dog was piddling. He actually uses the word piddling. <laughs> he says that's what the smell was. From here he goes on to talk in this interview about how America was becoming full of sin. Families were breaking up and he says that's why you get teenage runaways and I'm mad about that. I am not happy about that. That's why I had to do what I did. It was to teach America a lesson. Shut up. Shut up. He goes on to talk about how he's always been a good family man. He says, I loved my kids. When asked, were you ever violent with your children? He says, God, no. I would never hit my kids. Because God forbid that would be the worst thing you could ever do, is raise your hand to your own children. It's bonkers. Watching him sit and say these things, it's like, I'm sorry. Do you not? Do you not know who you are? Are you not aware of your own story? Do you not know you're John Wayne Gacy, mass murderer of teenage boys, as you sit condemning violence against children? It's so odd. You'll have heard in the intro music that I've been playing for these episodes. There's the voice of a woman talking about how Gacy should get the death penalty. Well, her son was one of the victims. Well, my feelings, I'd like to see them, you know, do something to him besides put him in a, you know, institution. I'd like to see him be, well, kill if I got my feelings to say. Prosecutor Robert Egan named Mrs. Wood's son along with all of Gacy's other victims as he opened for the state. Gacy talks about this woman during his TV interview and he says this. You know that mother that's calling for me to get 33 injections? Well, I think she should take 33 Valiums and just shut up. <sighs> okay. To end the story of Gacy, we'll just go back a little bit to Geoffrey Rigno from the earlier episode. He's the one, if you remember, who woke up in the park put there by Gacy. He's the one that went to police to tell them all about him but wasn't really believed and ended up stalking Gacy on his own. Well, geoffrey has got something else to say and it's an idea that's still out there, a thought still to be explored. Geoffrey says that in the haze, when he woke up in Gacy's bedroom, tied to that rack, he could see John Wayne Gacy standing in front of him, but there was another figure present. This Gacy survivor says, another man was standing in that bedroom, watching me be attacked. Now over the years, this idea has been pulled apart in so many ways. It's known that John Wayne Gacy had links to 
other paedophiles and that the images he took of the boys would be shared amongst paedophiles in Chicago. These men were all questioned and denied everything. John Wayne Gacy never mentioned and would not answer questions about whether or not he invited other men into his home to be a part of those crimes. And if there were other people involved, those men were never found. As his death by execution was approaching, Gacy tried to describe himself by saying, There are four Johns. John the Contractor. John the Clown. John the Politician. And then there's number four. Jack Hanley. Jack was the killer. He did all of the evil things. Timothy McCoy, 15. John Bukovic, 17. Daryl Sampson, 18. Randall Reffitt, 15. Sam Stepelto, 14. Michael Bonin, 17. William Carroll, 16. Rick Johnson, 17. Kenneth Parker, 16. William Bundy, 19. Gregory Godzik, 17. John Sick, 19. John Prestige, 20. Matthew Bowman, 19. Robert Gilroy, 18. John Murray, 19. Russell Nelson, 21. Robert Winch, 16. Tommy Bowling, 20. David Talsama, 19. William Kinfred, 19. Geoffrey Rignall, 25. Timothy O'Rourke, 20. Frank Landon, 19. James Mazzara, 21. Robert Peast. In 1994, John Wayne Gacy was executed by lethal injection. 16 years after his victims were found, and his last words were, Kiss my ass. And so ends the story. 1978, wasn't it great? President Carter legalises brewing beer at home. Lots of happy Americans everywhere. Okay, I'll end on this wee short story. It's very weird. (laughs) It's very weird, it's very short. It's this. In 1978, a man by the name of Gerardo Medina died. Now, Gerardo, he died from bone marrow complications. And he'd lived a life with sort of various health issues. Now, he was Peruvian and he died in Peru. Now, Gerardo isn't really kind of the story. Well, he is, kind of. But actually, it's more his mum that's the story. His mother is the bit that's interesting here. Gerardo had been born to his mother, Lima, 40 years before, when Lima was five years old. Yes. (laughs) You heard me correctly. You're not hallucinating. She was five years old when she gave birth to her son. I can hear you going, Barry, shut up. You're talking nonsense. (laughs) Let's be sceptical for a minute, right? And ask, how in the hell's bells is that possible? Well, when she was five years old, Lima Medina went to her parents complaining of a stomachache. Her belly was really swollen. Now, being five years old, her parents took her straight to the doctor, expecting to be told it's digestive issues. In fact, the doctor told them, your five-year-old is seven months pregnant. What the fuckity fuck? How is that even possible? So, immediately, authorities get involved, and straight away they suspect abuse. So her father is arrested for rape. He's taken to the police station, but he's let go after five days of interrogation because there is not a single shred of evidence that he's done anything wrong. So, if it can't be the father, police start looking at the cousins, the uncles, 
the neighbours, the teachers, every man possible is questioned and nothing. No idea who the father could be. Five-year-old Lima, she won't give up the information either. And try as they might, they can't get the information from her. So, at nine months, she gives birth. Not naturally, of course, because her body, like, couldn't handle that. It's a caesarean section. But she's five years old, and she has this son, Gerardo. So Gerardo grows up thinking that Lima is his sister, and that his grandparents are his mum and dad. And when he gets old enough, Lima tells him the truth. Now, of course, he has the same questions. Well, who's his father? But she won't say. Lima and her son Gerardo will spend their life dodging journalists, investigators, people who want the details. They are offered excessive amounts of money to speak about this, but they won't. Pressure really gets put on the hospital that was looking after her to, you know, hand over the scans, the x-rays, the cold, hard evidence that she'd been pregnant. And it's there. It's there in black and white. Photographs of her swollen, pregnant stomach at five years old can be seen. Now, because he had been so small when he was born... Gerardo had always suffered health issues, and by 1978, his body just gave up. Even as he was dying, Lima wouldn't tell him the identity of his father, and he died never knowing. Lima is still alive. She's almost 90. She's still living in Peru, and Lima will go to her grave without ever telling the world who got her pregnant at five years old. She's the youngest ever recorded mother in history. And so ends the episode. Okay then. Well, I'm out of here. Just to say again, thanks for listening. I appreciate your ears and your time. I know it's a competitive market, this podcasting game. I know there's better than me out there. There's, you know, other things you could be listening to. But hey, if you are one of those people that keeps coming back, I appreciate it. Okay. Love you. Bye. That was me just, like, trying something new for goodbye. I'm not sure it works. <laughs> Good evening. Just, just as the Roman Catholic ago, Church thought it had found a warm and compassionate successor to the late Pope Paul, it now finds it must search anew. Pope John Paul I is dead, his reign lasting just 33 days, the shortest in more than three centuries. Jerry Bowen reports from Vatican City. The body of Pope John Paul I lay in state today in the Clementine Hall of the Papal Apartments, not far from the bedroom where he died of a heart attack last night. Well, Terry, I reported over a week ago that Bundy was a suspect in the disorder. Now, Lord, authorities can, can continue to concentrate. What are my feelings? I'd like to see them, you know, do something to him besides put him in a, you know, institution. I'd like to see him be well, killed if I get my feelings to say. Prosecutor Robert Egan named Mrs. Wood's son along with all of Gacy's other victims as he opened for the state. Egan described Gacy as rational, premeditated, and evil, who killed his victims like flies evening, when they got in his way. Carefully planned murders that resulted in passionate successor to the late Pope Paul. It now finds it must search anew. For Pope John Paul I is dead. His reign lasting just 33 days, the shortest in more than three centuries. Jerry Bowen reports from Vatican City. I'll plead not guilty right now.